PS webinars. The title of today's webinar is Choosing a Graduate School in Physics and Related Disciplines. I'm Crystal Bailey, and I'll be your host for today's broadcast. Thank you all so much for joining us. APS webinars are brought to you as a service of the American Physical Society, connecting you with the expertise of indiv individuals who can offer insight into physics careers, educational programs, and professional development for students, working physicists, and educators. Today's presentation features Professor Peter Collings and will be moderated by Jacob Krish. Peter will be giving advice and answering your questions about choosing a graduate school in physics or a related discipline. After Professor Collings finishes the presentation, the remainder of the program belongs to you for our question and answer session. Because of the number of people attending this webinar, we are only accepting text questions. So if you would like to ask a question, please type it into the questions panel located on the right side of your screen. I also want to remind our listeners that you can continue to submit questions through the questions panel throughout the webinar, and we will answer all of your questions at the end of the webinar. We will do our best to cover all of the questions that you submit, but we want to apologize if we are unable to cover everything. And finally, a link to the recording of today's presentation will be emailed to you after today's event and will be available on the webinar uh, homepage that you'll be redirected to after the conclusion of the broadcast. We encourage you to complete the survey upon exiting so that APS webinars can improve its ability to provide you with these valuable services. And so with that, let's get started. Moderating the discussion today will be Jacob Krish. Jacob is a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University whose research focuses primarily on improving the efficiency of photovoltaic devices. He received his PhD in theoretical condensed matter physics from Harvard University in 2009. He also received an MMAS from Oxford University in 2003, where he studied as a Rhodes Scholar and a BA in physics with highest honors from Swarthmore College. And with that, I will turn things over to you, Jacob. Thank you, Crystal. Today, I get to introduce Professor Peter Collings, who is joining us to talk about choosing a graduate school in physics and related disciplines. Peter received a BA from Amherst College and PhD from Yale University. He's been teaching physics for 35 years, first at Kenyon College and then at Swarthmore College. His field, field of specialization is soft condensed matter physics, and over the years, many undergraduates have performed experimental research under his direction, which actually includes me. Most of these students have attended graduate programs in physics and are now government or industrial researchers, faculty members, administrators, engineers, postdocs, and graduate students. He's also an adjunct faculty member of the University of Pennsylvania, and in 1994 won the American Physical Society Prize for Research in an undergraduate institution. So Peter, why don't we uh, share your screen and get started? Thank you, Jacob. Let me see if I can get this technology to work. Uh, there we go. How does that look, Jacob? It looks good. OK. Um, thank you for the very nice introduction. Uh, let me first say that I realize the topic, choosing a graduate school in physics or a related discipline, uh, is a daunting one to many undergraduates. Um, I'm hoping what uh, we talk about today will uh, shed some light on the process and uh, help, in fact, uh, take some of that, uh, how shall I say, intimidation factor away and uh, put a plan in place for many of you. Uh, as far as related discipline, um, there are some that are very close to physics as far as uh, choosing a graduate school. These include astronomy, astrophysics, applied physics, uh, material science, chemical physics, computational physics, uh, engineering physics, and even uh, straight, uh, some straight engineering programs. So what we have to say about physics really does apply to them quite well. Um, it's also appropriate to other physical sciences, uh, like chemistry, geophysics, may, maybe oceanography. But I, I will say that uh, it is less appropriate for graduate programs in uh, the life sciences, where things are done differently. 
in order to take this large topic and uh, try to make it as um, directed as possible, I had to make a couple of assumptions. Um, I've assumed you've decided to apply to graduate school. Um, if you're not sure, and I suspect many of you are not sure, um, I do think this webinar will be very useful because it will really shed a lot of light on the process and what goes into thinking about graduate school, and that should be quite helpful. Um, I've also assumed your preparation is fairly traditional, uh, meaning that your major is in physics. Uh, if it is not, uh, then there are there can be important implications, and if there are some questions uh, in this direction, we can get to them later. Um, I've al I also will not say anything about the fact that you probably will not have to pay for your graduate education. If you're not aware of this, um, you should uh, look into it. It's actually true. And in thinking about the process, uh, I've decided that perhaps the most mysterious parts are two steps. The first is selecting the schools that you will apply to, and the second, choosing the school that you will attend once you receive uh, acceptances. Um, in these areas, students tend to have a lot of questions and very few answers, and so we'll try to work on that. You will see that the webinar is a combination of information and advice. Uh, I think it will be very clear when it's information and when it's advice. So let's go to the first uh, part, which is choosing the graduate schools to apply to. Uh, I must say, this is different from choosing an undergraduate institution, something that you have all done uh, before. Uh, you will see that the focus is on a single department or even perhaps a single research area within a department. And this changes things quite a bit when you start looking at the various options. So what should you look for in a graduate program? Well, if you know the area that you're interested in pursuing, then you need to look for strength in that particular area. There are There is a good bit of variation um, on one university campus as far as the strength within different research areas. And certainly from university to university, there is quite a variation. So you need to look carefully at that. Um, if you are unsure of your area of interest, and that usually includes a good proportion of students going on to graduate school, you might be more interested in strength across the discipline of physics, and even in departments that are related and share some of the research areas of physics. Um, in some areas of study, you need access to specialized facilities. Uh, telescopes, accelerators, uh, national laboratories are examples of this. Again, if your area of interest um, is one of these, you need to look at programs to see what that access is. Uh, you will find that uh, programs differ from university to university as far as how much coursework, what the qualifying exam is, what happens at the end when it's time to defend your thesis. So you really need to look at the structure of the program uh, to see which one sounds most appropriate for you. And some of you might find that geographical location and or university setting are important factors. Obviously, there are graduate programs across the United States. Uh, but universities, although most are located in cities, uh, can be in very different cities and different neighborhoods within cities, and this may or may not be important. If I can interject, um, the structure of the program is something that is very important to how life in graduate school goes, and it's one of the easiest things to actually find from university websites, because the structure of the program in terms of how many courses are going to be required, whether there is uh, a qualifying exam that's written or if it's oral, and how it is that people find the research groups that they will do their theses in, all of that uh, tends to be very well detailed on websites. And so you can find out a lot and see if the programs match uh, what it is you think you want. OK, let's move to uh, some aspects of admissions, things that you will need to think about. Um, 
you probably can guess what graduate schools look at when they look at candidates for admissions in their programs. They look at the quality of the undergraduate preparation. They read the letters of recommendation very carefully. Uh, they take note of GRE scores. They try to ascertain what type of research experience an applicant has. Um, so you can look at these criteria and gain some information on your chance of being admitted. You do this by going to uh, resources that we'll get to later where you can find the percent of applicants admitted to a particular program. You can find out what the average GRE score of admitted students are. Um, you can find out at your own institution what the success of prior applicants from your school have been to various programs. Um, you may have contacts with faculty at a graduate school, and those faculty might be able to give you some idea of your um, chances of being admitted. Um, but I think the bottom line is that predicting uh, the admissions outcome can be very difficult. Uh, it can depend on factors that you uh, have no knowledge of. Uh, for instance, how many other applicants are applying for the same research area? Or is a faculty member that you met at that graduate school pulling quite strongly for your admission? So my general advice is that uh, you should apply to schools that represent various levels of selectivity as far as you're concerned. That is, schools where your chances of being admitted range from excellent to fair. Remember, excellent programs exist at many different types of institutions. So the idea is to put a pool together of institutions that you're excited about, uh, but where your um, chance of being ad uh, admitted varies uh, across the board. This will give you the best choices of, uh, when acceptances roll out. The most time-consuming part of the process is really gathering information about graduate programs. Uh, you must leave time for this to happen before applications are due. Um, you can check uh, department and faculty websites. These are uh, very Peter, informative. I, I think yeah. you went to advance the slide one. I do. Thank you, Jacob. Um, these websites are getting more and more informative each year. You can find out about the programs, as, as Jacob has uh, mentioned, and you can find out about, about faculty and their research areas. Um, there's a book that's published every year by the American Institute of Physics called Graduate Programs in Physics, Astronomy, and Related Fields. This book is sent to every undergraduate physics department. It is loaded with information and statistics on all the graduate programs uh, in the United States. Uh, you, I can sum it up by saying it's all in there, perhaps not in the nicest form, but it is a place where you can get data um, and numbers uh, to see what is going on. Um, there's an online uh, app called Grad School Shopper. Um, you might find this useful in narrowing down your choices. So take a look at that. Um, uh, it works quite well. Um, and don't be shy in uh, asking questions of people. Uh, you can email departments uh, and ask about their graduate programs. If you can find out the names of current or past graduate students there, uh, don't hesitate to email them. While I can't guarantee that everyone will reply, I think I can say that most will uh, be very useful in their responses. Um, you should talk to the physics professors at your undergraduate institution. They know you. They know the history of students applying to various graduate schools from your institution. And each one of them has some familiarity with uh, some graduate programs. So checking in with them, there's a lot you can learn about uh, both the admission side of things, your chances of being accepted, and facts uh, and information about specific graduate programs. Especially if you are not at an institution with a graduate physics uh, program, um, I advise you to visit uh, some graduate schools. This can, these can be very informal visits, just one or two just to see what a graduate uh, um, uh, department looks like, get a feeling for what it might be uh, like to be a graduate student. 
um, if I can add it in also, the, uh, when I started applying to graduate school, uh, the applications tend to be due around December. And I started looking sort of casually in the spring before it and got very serious at the beginning of the fall semester. So by September, um, getting involved in that. When, when I was doing it, the AIP book was amazing. It, it's a really great resource. And most of the information that's in that is now in Grad School Shopper. Um, but it's a, it's a really great way to have overviews of all the different programs, which can really help very rapidly narrow down the, the set of places where you'd be interested in going. Uh, thanks, Jacob. Uh, let's move to the second part of uh, my remarks. Uh, we're now uh, assuming you uh, put that pool of schools together, uh, you applied to those schools, and you received a number of acceptances. Um, how do you go about choosing the actual school to attend? Well, the first thing I want to say is after you receive an acceptance, you should realize that you are now in charge. Uh, the graduate program that accepted you very much wants you to attend their institution. You should feel very free to ask for whatever information and contacts that you think are necessary um, and keep asking until you get the information you need. I think you'll find that graduate schools at this point will be very, very forthcoming in uh, trying to get you the information you ask. So the first step should be to study each offer of admission that you get. Um, they all won't be the same, and it's important that you uh, understand the differences. If teaching and research is involved, find out what the nature of the obligation is. How long will that obligation be in effect? Uh, you might want to find out um, how the matching is done between graduate students and thesis advisors. Again, there's, there's a range of the way departments do that. Uh, some departments will assign you a faculty member to start doing research with just to get your, um, you know, to get into a lab or working with a professor. Um, and that's assigned right at the beginning. Uh, the other end of the range would be a department that actually puts together a course all first year graduate students take where the faculty come in and talk about the research going on and what's coming, what it looks like for the future. Uh, so that students can make uh, informed um, uh, uh, decisions at that point. Uh, so you might want to look at how that is done. Uh, part of that process um, is to understand that there will be a shifting of support from the department, which will be supporting first-year students, most of the first-year students, to support by the research advisor. Uh, find out when that is done. Uh, a good way is to ask uh, in the summer following the first year, uh, what, is the, what are the procedures for getting funding to do research that summer? Is it through the department? Is it through the advisor? Again, um, look into these because these will be different uh, at the different uh, institutions. You might have been thinking about deferring admission uh, for a year. Uh, now would be the time to bring that up, uh, not earlier. Um, you will find out that different institutions respond differently to the possibility of deferring your uh, admission. And again, if that's something you're thinking about, uh, I would ask lots of questions and talk quite frankly to them about the possibility. Even if you're not sure, you may want to find out what the options are. And if you really do want to get a head start, you might ask about the possibility of arriving um, the summer before you start and uh, getting your hands dirty doing some research uh, with support from the, the uh, graduate school. So I, I would say that um, graduate school can be um, quite an experience. And having some time off, regardless of whether you're coming straight from your undergraduate or you've been out working or doing something else, having a little bit of time to yourself before you get started in that is um, not a bad idea. So now the idea is to find the program that meets your needs the best. And so you'll, you'll go through the things we talked about before. You'll look at the strengths of the overall program 
Um, you'll look at the strength in specific areas for the different options you have and, and really try to test them against what you think your needs are. Um, you'll look at the structure of the program. Uh, Jacob mentioned how important this is. Um, but you might go a bit further at this time. Ask about you know, how long does it take on average um, for uh, the degree? Um, what, what's the percentage of graduate, uh, graduate students that leave before they get their um, degree? Things like that might be important in thinking about your own situation. Uh, as I mentioned before, how important is geographical location or the university setting? Um, perhaps opportunities for your significant other now need to be weighed quite heavily. And then there are all sorts of intangibles. Um, what's the graduate student community like at uh, uh, these institutions? Uh, within the department, what is the climate for women and minorities? What are student-faculty relationships? Uh, what do they tend to be? These are things that you should start thinking about um, as you try to narrow down uh, the number of schools that you are uh, uh, still considering. And if, if I can add, these, these are things that really do affect your life as a graduate student. The, um, if you know exactly what kind of field you want to work in or who it is you might want to work with, the procedures for finding um, a research advisor will not be that important. But if you're very unsure about what you want, there can be a big difference between uh, schools where the process is entirely informal, where you just have to go up to faculty and see if they're interested, versus some that have rotations that will actually make you move in three or four month stays in a few different groups in order to see what they're like. And the intangibles are also very important. I mean, it's, it, it cannot be overstated how important it is whether the graduate community is um, happy. You know, what are the relationships between the graduate students with each other, with the, with the faculty, the faculty with each other, and, and the ways to find that out, which we'll talk about next, um, are, are, uh, are really important. Um, what Jacob is alluding to is that part of the process for choosing uh, the graduate school should be uh, visits, and these are really important. You should try to narrow down your choices um, before visiting uh, because you're going to be in the second semester of your senior year in most cases. It's going to be a very visit, a very busy time. Uh, you're not going to have a huge amount of time for visiting. Um, but you should end up visiting all the schools that are still in contention in your mind as possible graduate schools. Um, I think it's safe to say that these visits will result in strong and probably very accurate impressions of life as a graduate student um, at uh, the various institutions. And that's why I say they are extremely important. Um, it's nice to know that departments will usually help pay for your visit. Uh, they do this in various ways, but if, in fact, uh, they don't offer, you should certainly ask. Um, most departments arrange a visit day. And if you can make it, make it on, a visit on that day or days, uh, that's probably optimum. But it doesn't have to happen on the visit day. You can schedule your visit on your own. Uh, the only thing that I would advise you here is that you should make arrangements to see people specifically ahead of time. Uh, it won't be arranged for you, so you need to contact the people you want to talk to, whether they are department chairs, faculty members, graduate students, and make those arrangements so that your time on campus will be spent wisely. Um, during your visit, talk to as many people as you can. As I say, this includes the professors uh, and graduate students. Uh, if it's possible, stay overnight. Uh, that gives you many more chances to have very informal conversations with a wider range of people. Uh, seek out student opinions on their experience. Um, and uh, as Jacob mentioned, try to gauge what the situation is for students and faculty as far as how they relate to each other and um, you know what this happiness factor are they glad to be there are they happy to do the work they're doing uh, these things can be very important to you and if you stay for a little while and simply ask questions of people over a period of time you should get a good feeling for this 
without naming any names, when I went through this process, it was remarkable how obvious it was which places had generally happy graduate students and which places did not have um, quite as happy graduate students. And so the, the chance to actually visit and see that, it, it's the kind of thing you can't tell until you actually go and you talk to a lot of people. You don't, you don't want to um, exaggerate from meeting one particularly happy person or one particularly unhappy person, because you will find those anywhere you go. But as you meet a lot of them over the course of, a, especially of a visit day, you can really get a chance to assess that very well. OK, we're almost at the end. Um, so let's talk about making that final decision a little bit. Um, I guess one thing you might realize is that the financial offer might not be as important as uh, you might think uh, at the beginning. But these offers tend to be fairly similar um, and in accordance with the cost of living. Uh, so it's usually not the crucial component. Um, Keep an open mind during uh, the, this end uh, game. There are many wonderful programs uh, out there, uh, many uh, gifted researchers in all areas of physics and related science. Um, you know, don't let name recognition influence your decision too much. Um, you should really look at what you are interested and excited about. And how do things at the institution match your interests and excitement? Uh, is it many areas that you might be picking from? Is it a single area? Really try to look at how the, that match is going to be made. And think seriously about your career goals and concentrate uh, on how well your needs will be satisfied. Um, look as far down the road as you can. And you know this is quite difficult, um, because sometimes it's not clear at all where you're going to end up. But look as far as you can. And ask yourself if you think the program will put you on a good trajectory uh, based on as how far down the road you can look. And if things really do get tough at the end, and you're trying to make a choice uh, between two schools, really don't stress out about it. You've probably gotten to the point where uh, either will be a wonderful choice and a successful choice for you. Um, and there's really no reason to think that the world hinges on this decision. I, I, I would reiterate that if you're, if you're one of the people who is blessed with some kind of certainty about what your career goals are, then it can be so, sometimes uh, relatively easy to figure out which programs will best set you up to do what it is that you want to do. And if you're one of the larger group of people that is not quite sure, then it, it really means that you want to look for a program that can satisfy a range of possibilities you might find good. And so you can find out what people tend to do when they come out from programs and see if those are things that you can imagine yourself doing. And also, for those of you who are very confident about what you want, a lot of my classmates who were very confident when they came in are doing completely different things now. So you may also want to check on how broad uh, the possibilities are, just in case you change your mind. Great. OK, we're coming to the close of uh, my remarks. Um, I've mentioned some resources, so I thought I'd uh, list these at the end. You don't have to write them down. Um, as uh, was said in the introduction, the entire webinar will be available, and the slides will be available uh, on the AGS website. But uh, let's go through these resources just one last time. Uh, really, what you should be doing is reading, surfing, and talking. Uh, the general idea here is this is not a decision you make on your own, uh, thinking very carefully uh, about all the potential uh, opportunities out there. You should be really uh, gathering information and talking to lots of people. Uh, there's the AIP book that both Jacob and I have mentioned, uh, a good resource, uh, all in paper, and the Grad School Shopper, an online app. Uh, um, but there's another resource out there that I want to emphasize at this point. Uh, the American Association of Physics Teachers provides an excellent resource on its uh, website, and I list the uh, link there. Uh, this has a lot more about the application process, some of the nuts and bolts, including some of the topics that we've been talking about today. But this is also an excellent site. And I guess I'm biased, and I'll end by saying that uh, you really shouldn't hesitate to talk to as many of your professors as possible. 
Uh, one of the things you'll find out is that uh, they will not always agree on uh, their, how shall I say, evaluation of the same graduate programs. They might not even agree on your chances of being admitted in graduate programs in a certain graduate program. So I think it's important that you talk to as many of them as possible. Obviously, the ones that know you best but I would uh, strike up conversations with others also. So uh, with that, let me turn it back to Jacob for any last comments he might have, um, and then we'll enter the question and answer part of the webinar. Great. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I think that was, that was great. And it's now time for Q&A. We have a lot of good questions. And uh, please feel free to keep submitting them. And I'll do my best to, uh, to pick ones for, for us to talk about. So, um, we have a range of different topics of question, but one that um, has come up is how to best assess the quality of your preparation for a particular program. How can you figure out which school is um, a good match or a reach or something like that? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, I'm assuming that uh, as an undergraduate physics major, um, your preparation includes uh, an introductory course, usually some, um, um, some intermediate courses in topics such as modern physics, sometimes mechanics, and then junior, senior level courses in um, you know, the main areas of physics, uh, mechanics, quantum mechanics, electricity and magnetism, um, uh, statistical mechanics, maybe optics and some other things. Um, with these types of courses um, uh, and the mathematics that's usually required that, to go with it, uh, in general you can say my preparation is what is expected by the graduate schools. Um, the question I think was uh, really asking about, well, graduate schools different are different, uh, different uh, school, the incoming class, uh, has different backgrounds for each of these schools. How might you figure where you fit in? Um, I think that's where you can get some good information from uh, professors at your school because they know um, what the track record has been to students going to various programs. Those that felt very prepared, those that uh, um, you know really excelled once they got there, um, those that uh, had problems that were felt their preparation uh, uh, was lacking in some respect. Uh, so you can get information on particular programs from uh, the faculty. Uh, I think uh, a very simple way of getting some idea is to um, look at uh, the GRE scores of uh, the admitted students. Um, these are going to tell you something about the general background level or preparation level and what kind of work uh, these students are able to do uh, when they uh, um, get, uh, when they arrive. Um, graduate schools are different. Uh, some will actually um, look very carefully at your preparation and maybe even suggest that uh, along with graduate courses, you take an undergraduate uh, junior senior level course in a certain area. Uh, again, so talking to people at particular schools and telling them about your backgrounds and the textbooks that were used, um, you might be able to get some feedback from them. Yeah, I, I, I would uh, I would definitely agree that um, asking your professors about what where your chances are are realistic and looking at your GRE scores are are probably the the two best ways to figure out what's going on, in particular if you are a physics major. I mean, if you have the standard background of an American university uh, physics education, it will be relatively easy to do that assessment. If you are trying to uh, switch fields in the course of going to graduate school, it will be harder to figure out. And, and you just have to deal with the fact that it will be somewhat difficult to know in advance because you will not be like um, the other applicants. And then you should do all of those things, the, the GRE and talking to uh, your undergraduate professors, but also trying to just reach out and talk to people at the graduate school can be a good way to help out if you're one of those non-standard cases. 
So let's see, moving on, we have uh, another question, which is, how do you tell about the climate for women at a university? And if I can take a first stab at that, I, I, I believe that statistics for the fraction of the graduate classes that are women are available inside the AIP book. I can't remember if that's true. Um, but I, I do believe there are statistics around which will tell you things about uh, how, how um, small the or large the uh, female population will be in the classes. And otherwise, it's a great way to reach out to people. You can, you can, if you know people out of school that you are interested in talking to, reaching out to the graduate students is probably a more effective way of getting an answer to this question than reaching out to the administration. Um, or the or the faculty themselves, and I think that graduate students are in general quite happy to talk about this. And so, if you uh, write to, if you you can just cold write to people if you want to, you can find grad student web pages and ask them a couple of questions. Just be careful, don't uh, I mean, don't harass um, an entire class of people, but um, don't don't ask just one because <laughs> individual experiences can vary a bit. Uh, Peter, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. I'll just uh, really uh, say I think Jacob has hit the, the two main points in that statistics are available. And if you look, you can actually find out the number of women in various programs. Uh, this goes for minorities also. These statistics are available. Um, and you can certainly uh, look for contacts and try to find out uh, from a distance uh, uh, what uh, women and minorities in various programs uh, have to say about their experience. Um, but I certainly would put this on uh, your agenda for the visit uh, when you uh, uh, drop in on uh, schools. Uh, you should make sure you have a chance to talk to um, uh, graduate students, women, minorities across the board, and, and ask them about their experience. And I think especially knowing some of the statistics and then following up with a visit um, you can walk away with a pretty good idea of what the climate's going to be like. And, and I have to say, I'm even getting through the um, the question submission. There are other suggestions coming in that the uh, APS website apparently has descriptions of the female friendliness of graduate programs. And you can also look for the number of women faculty. Um, so thank you for those who are helping out to answer with the questions. We appreciate it. Um, so there's a number of questions that have come up about uh, deferring admission. These have come, uh, in what case would it be a good idea uh, to do it? And if you know that you want to defer, in, is it better to apply and then try to defer or to apply again the next year? And uh, a, a few variants of, of this question. So uh, Peter. Um, good question. I guess I would ask myself um, if I were applying if if I was sure I did not want to start graduate school the following year. Um, and if that's the case, I don't think it makes much sense to apply. Um, uh, your chances uh, of being accepted into a graduate program are not going to change um, um, that much in one year. And especially if during that uh, year, uh, you gain some more experience, either working in a technical job or doing research. It might actually uh, help your chances. So if you're sure you don't want to attend graduate school the following fall, I think it, I can't think of too many reasons why you should uh, go through the application process. Um, but for many students, it's a question that's not answerable, and therefore, you know, you need a game plan, and a game plan of applying to some schools, seeing what happens, and making the decision to defer or not, you know, whenever it's possible, is certainly an appropriate thing to, get, to do. Uh, as I said, I wouldn't mention it at all during the application process, but if you are thinking of deferring, possibly deferring, um, after you have been accepted, I think you should ask um, what would happen if you do that? Um, the answers actually differ quite a bit. At some schools, they have a mechanism by which they basically keep your application um, for a year, open it up, and pretty much guarantee that you will be accepted the following year. Um, other universities will actually make you go through the application process 
Uh, they might say, well, we accepted you this year, so we probably will next year. Um, but that's um, but they will not guarantee that or even uh, make it sound like it's uh, close to 100% probable. Um, and then, you know, on the other end, there might be some universities that actually say, just let us know uh, for sure before April 1st of next year, and uh, you know, we'll simply put you in the uh, incoming class. So you might get different um, uh, different uh, responses, and that's why it's important to ask. And you could very well still be thinking about whether you want to defer when you ask that question. Uh, and knowing all the parameters is probably important as you make that decision. Um, great. I think that was that was quite thorough. So there's a, there's a set of questions on the subject of master's programs, uh, either by themselves or leading into PhDs. So uh, if I can bundle these together, there, there are questions about whether it's possible to take part-time master's programs, whether those exist, and uh, whether getting a master's in physics before applying to the PhD program will affect the admissions process. Will, will that make it uh, more uh, likely to be admitted? Um, I, I would say that um, there are part-time master's programs that, that are, exist, which are uh, ma terminal master's programs. The one, my understanding about this, and I, I don't know the details of all of them, certainly, um, but the one of the assumptions that Peter put on at the very beginning is that you won't have to pay for graduate school. And that's not necessarily the case of uh, especially part-time master's programs. So there may be financial aid, and it may be the kind of thing that you can work in a lab to help pay for. But the general structure of, of those master's programs can be different. Um, and I'll pass the rest of it over to Peter. Um, yeah, Jacob is actually quite right. Um, over the last decade or so, there's been quite a, a nice increase in the um, types of master's programs out there for uh, physics majors. Um, I think it's been realized that uh, there are students who want some more technical background and want to enter in a very technical uh, part of the workforce, uh, but not necessarily are uh, looking to become uh, PhD physicists. And programs have been put in place that allow uh, students to do this uh, at a slower pace, so-called part-time. Um, many of these programs have linked to um, industry in the area and actually try to uh, put together some program where there is work at an industry and work at the university going on uh, to satisfy the master's uh, requirements. Um, so if, if this sounds um, like the direction you might want to go, um, I think there are some very, very high-quality, innovative programs out there, uh, and you just need to, to look around for them. Um, it used to be the case where without those types of programs, the advice usually given was that, you know, uh, to apply for the PhD program, and if, depending on how you felt after one or two years, um, either continue on to the PhD or stop at the master's level. That is still a, um, um, that might still be a useful uh, protocol to follow for people who are really undecided about exactly what they want to do. Uh, the question about would doing master's work um, help as far as being accepted into PhD programs, um, I think the answer is, uh, yes and no. Um, if for some reason uh, coming out of your undergraduate institution, um, your background might be considered uh, weak and then going to, into a master's program where you've done well and shown that you can work at that level, that's definitely going to uh, uh, look better to uh, uh, graduate programs, graduate PhD programs. Uh, if, on the other hand, the master's program is just uh, more of the same, so to speak, just continuing on uh, without really changing uh, your background, it might not help that much. Um, in that case, it would be hard for me to say ahead of time what effect it would have. So I think it really depends on the circumstances about whether um, that, that master's degree is going to make a difference. 
Great. Um, so we have uh, some people who joined us late, and so there's a very simple question, which I've gotten a couple times, which is, how early should we start looking for graduate schools? And uh, just, just to say again, um, the advice that we've given is really you should starting no later than the, the beginning of the fall where the applications are due in uh, December. But starting earlier is helpful because there's a lot of graduate schools. If you start earlier, you can consider more of them. Um, but it's a full application process. So you're going to want to find out where you want to apply and leave yourself enough time to do a good job on your applications. Um, I, I will add that leaving enough time is important because at first it's going to feel like there is way too many possibilities out there and there's no way to sort through them. Um, but just as in any theoretical or experimental uh, problem, you have to start somewhere. So you start looking, you start asking, and you slowly build up a feeling for what's out there in relationship to what you're interested in and what your goals are. And then it seems to start making a little more sense and the schools start to come out of the woodwork with some looking more or less attractive. And after a bit of time, you actually start to feel better about the whole process. But I guess the bottom line Jacob and I are trying to tell you is that that process might not be possible to be speeded up. It might just take time, talk, surfing, thinking. Um, and therefore, you should allow uh, time for it. Absolutely. OK, so uh, our next question is whether graduate schools prefer that your undergraduate curriculum be more experimental or theoretical, or if it depends on what types of programs one is applying for. Um, I, I think that the, the curricula of undergraduate physics is, physics is actually quite unified in its understanding of what it is constitutes uh, the basics of it. So everybody will have taken electricity and magnetism, quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics. And um, if you don't have a background in any of those things, then, then you will find it difficult um, going into graduate school. But the, um, the question of whether your undergraduate curriculum itself is more strongly based this way is, is I, I would shift in a different direction to say if you can show that you have some background in research, that you have, you've had a chance either inside or outside, especially outside of the classroom, to show that you know what research is and you like it, and, uh, and even better, that you're good at it, that will be a very important plus for going into graduate admissions. Now, not everybody has it. Not everybody has research experience before they go in, but a lot of people do. And seeking out those opportunities, if you still have the time for them, is really good. Th th this feeds into another question about um, if you're taking a year off so that you can improve uh, your chances of admissions into graduate school, is it best to take that time to study really hard for the GREs to improve those scores? And I, I would say that I think that Certainly, having a better GRE score will not hurt. But relatedly, if you had a chance to get some research experience, that would look really good and could potentially have a letter from your research supervisor who can attest to your understanding of physics and your creativity and your ability and interest in the field. And those things are, are really important in the admissions process. Um, I, Jacob's exactly right. I think uh, the research experience among the applicants is uh, getting is being given more and more weight uh, in the selection process. Um, and so it's something that uh, you certainly should seek out if you uh, have the time uh, and make sure it is prominent in your application. Um, certainly if you've done research uh, with someone, they should be writing a letter of recommendation for you and describing uh, the role you played in the research and your skill level um, doing research. Um, as far as the theoretical, experimental part of the question, um, the fact is that more students um, uh, are admitted, well, let's say apply to and are admitted to graduate programs interested in theoretical physics than the graduate programs can actually handle. And so um, if you do uh, write your application that you're interested in theoretical physics, uh, it is going to be looked at to see uh, uh, what your background is um, and uh, do you have the aptitude for theoretical physics. So there they're going to look at your undergraduate courses, uh, especially the highly theoretical ones, and how many there were and how well you did with them. 
Um, but uh, besides that, if you don't uh, make it uh, clear that you're uh, very interested in theoretical physics, um, they are going to look at two things. One is, do you have the background that will get you through the required courses? Um, that's going to be mainly theoretical courses. And then the second question is, do you have the skills at research so that once you're done with your courses, that you thrive in the, in the laboratory or doing theory or computation? And so that what comes out of it is a really uh, high class uh, thesis. Those are the two things they're trying to ascertain when they look at your application. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so our next question is from an older returning undergraduate student uh, who wants to know what effect, if any, uh, their age and experience could have on acceptance into a graduate program. Um, that's a good question. I don't know if I um, have a clear answer to it. Uh, I think I, I think the bottom line is they're going to look at you as a, a future graduate student and ask how successful you're going to be. Um, on one hand, you wouldn't think um, age should make a big difference. Uh, and if that's the way they feel, I think you're likely to be judged uh, um, just as any other applicant would be judged. On the other hand, they might say this person is older, perhaps more mature, knows what they uh, really want to get out of graduate school, has more uh, work experience or something like that, and that might actually look good to them. Uh, maybe they would see a person who would be very goal-oriented and uh, uh, would make sure everything uh, was successful. Um, so I certainly wouldn't make any generalizations about um, whether things would be different I think they're going to be asking the question, how successful are you going to be? And um, you know, you should think about your background um, and your situation uh, and see if you can guess how they might answer that. So we have a whole set of questions about the GREs. So I'm going to bundle those all together um, and start out with uh, mechanical questions of do we need to know where we want to send our GRE scores when we sign up to take the test? The answer to that is no. You can you can choose to send your scores later. Um, but then th there are questions about how important the physics GREs are. Um, if you score poorly on it but have an otherwise good record, uh, how will it affect your chances of getting in? And uh, what is the best time to take the GRE? Um, and in particular, what if you don't know your GRE scores before you begin applying or looking for schools? Well, Jacob, can you answer the question of when the best time to take the GRE is? Um, I think the best time to take it is the, uh, I mean, there, there's two things that, that go there. You, you need to have time to study for it. Um, and ideally, you would like to get the answers in time to help inform your applications. So you need to look at when it's available and give the earliest time that you think you're going to be ready for it. Uh, it's, it's a lot of work to go in. It's sort of a, you know, all of these standardized tests can be grueling to take. So you, you want to go in and not just do it over and over again. Um, but, but you need to allow yourself the time. So look at what the GRE covers and when, when it is you will have covered that material in your courses and your studying time. But, but then, subject to that, take it as early as possible. So um, I took mine, I believe, in the uh, early fall of my senior year, for whatever that's worth. And the, the questions of how important they are is a real difficult one to answer because I think the only thing I can say is that different programs weight the GRE score very differently. Um, and uh, I think you can probably get that information um, ahead of time by making contacts uh, with people at different institutions, talking to your professors to figure you know, what the history has been. But they are very important for some programs, less so uh, for others. Um, it is not an impossible test. Uh, I think most graduate programs think it's a test that they would like their applicants to do well on. Uh, they take it seriously, therefore you should take it very seriously. Um, I think it's been proven that studying for the GRE, studying the 
a, a range of material from uh, introductory to advanced um, certainly does help your GRE score. I think it also uh, is true that understanding the nature of the exam ahead of time is very, very important. Um, it's an exam where you need to know how you should spend time on questions, how many questions you should answer, and you should go in having done practice exams uh, and knowing how best to uh, maximize your score. Uh, but th the bottom line is I think it's weighted very differently by different programs, and it might be something you'd like to find out. Great. So we have a couple questions about people who are interested in theory and how important it is to have a strong mathematics background, pure and applied, a math minor for admissions into theory. Um, and if I can take that as someone, I, I actually, so I am a, I am a theoretical condensed matter physicist, um, though when I applied to graduate school, I thought I was going to be an experimentalist. So certainly one can uh, change directions in these ways. But um, having, if, if you want to go and be a theorist, uh, the, the admissions committee will often have people who are looking out at students they might want to take. And having uh, a strong math background is, a, is an excellent way to indicate students who are going to fit in well. But you don't necessarily need to have taken a lot of math courses in order for it to be, the, in order for you to show that you have a good background that will make you capable of doing theoretical physics. So if you have done very well in the ones that you have taken, and you can have ref references that say that you are very good at mathematics and you can learn what you need, that, that can be good. But certainly having a, a math minor or um, other markers of a strong math background will, will not hurt you in uh, going into a theory program. I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Peter. No, just to reiterate that uh, the competition, I think, for the theoretical uh, slots uh, in PhD programs is uh, tougher than experimental spots. So um, just keep that in mind. Okay, so we have uh, a bunch of other questions on the how to make your how to assess the attractiveness of uh, of yourself to graduate programs and how to make you more attractive. So, for example, uh, there are questions about how important your undergraduate institution is to it. So if you have uh, otherwise similar uh, external markers, but uh, say GRE scores and research experience, but um, come from uh, a really uh, name brand institution versus uh, a less name brand institution. How much does that affect um, the admissions? And then there's uh, a, I will say, related question of um, whether taking graduate physics courses while in college, uh, how, how much that will help in terms of getting admissions into graduate school. Uh, let me answer the, the second one first because uh, it's a little bit uh, shorter. Um, I don't think the number of courses that you've taken past uh, the standard ones uh, is important. I think how well you do on the courses you take is, uh, is much more important. So uh, I certainly would expect a graduate program to find uh, a standard uh, applicant who has just excelled in every physics course more attractive than one who has taken graduate courses um, and just done mediocre work. So I, I think the bottom line should be find ways to really do your best. Uh, it's quality, not quantity, once you get by uh, the standard program. Um, as far as um, the first part of the question, uh, which was sort of how do you make yourself attractive and what happens coming from different institutions, um, I do think there is something you can do here. Um, you can certainly find out what the track record is from your institution to programs of the type you're interested in. Uh, that will tell you a lot about your chances. Um, and I think if there isn't much of a track record, um, then I think you should try to make some contacts with faculty uh, or the chair at that graduate program. Um, because when they are looking at similar applicants and trying to decide between them, um, I mean, these are humans. And if uh, name recognition is there, it is going to uh, play a role in some way or another. But the point is that that name recognition can be completely overturned 
by uh, someone speaking about meeting the student, uh, uh, having a nice conversation with the student. The student seems to be very uh, hardworking and dedicated. Uh, I think uh, uh, he or she would do really well here. So there are things you can do uh, if you're worried about uh, losing out in the last moments of this. And that's why I think it's important uh, uh, to perhaps visit before um, acceptance time and to have some email contact with faculty. So you're not a complete stranger um, if they don't have a track record of students having come uh, from your undergraduate institution. Great. So it unfortunately looks like we're out of time. Um, I'd like to thank Peter again for uh, your informative presentation, and uh, I'll hand things back over to Crystal. Yes, uh, thanks a lot, both of you, for the really great discussion. We have had so many wonderful questions, and um, there are many still yet to discuss. Um, that This is all the time that we have for the official webinar, um, but for those of you whose schedules permit, we will be able to stay around for a short period of time uh, to continue the discussion. However, for those who are signing off now, uh, we do welcome you to follow up with speakers. You can send an email to webinars.aps.org, and we will forward your questions. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, slides of the presentation and the recording of today's broadcast will be available on this webinar's page on um, APS.org, and you'll be directed there at the end of the broadcast today. Um, and lastly, in order to help us continue to develop quality webinar presentations, please help us out by taking a moment to complete the short survey as you exit. And uh, that wraps up today's event, and we hope you'll join us again next time. Okay, so, and I have to, um, I have to chime in about the GRE thing. Um, I think it's an excellent question. I can say that I was lucky in that the place that I ended up going to grad school, they didn't care that much about my GRE score because my physics GRE was abysmal. <laughs> um, and here I am, PhD, gainfully employed. So, you know, um, it, it's important. I agree that it's important. But if for some reason something goes awry and you don't have a good day, it's not going to make it impossible for you to go to graduate school. That's what I had to say about that. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you, Crystal. So it, it, so if I understand, we're just going to keep taking questions for another few minutes. And yes. Is, is that right? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, one, one of the questions that comes in is, um, which is more important when choosing a graduate school? The, the funding level, the access to uh, experimental tools, or the freedom to pursue your own research interest uh, for each graduate student? And if I can say, the, the, the answer to that sort of depends on you. Um, it depends on what you, what you want to do. If you have very clear ideas of what you want and you want the freedom to pursue them, then that's going to be the most important thing. Um, and if you uh, are not, as many people going into graduate school, are not exactly sure what it is and you're, you're looking to apprentice yourself in a, um, inside a group to find out uh, what, what is this thing, which is advanced physics, um, and what is it that you'd like to do, then, then the freedom that you get might be relatively less important. I mean, ideally, you want to have a place that uh, has access to great people and tools, and that will uh, train you and then give you more flexibility as you go through it. And that's the kind of thing that you can assess by going and talking to graduate students when you go visit graduate schools, is to find out how much control they have over what they do or whether they are dedicated to fulfilling the work that is of, um, of a grant. And even within an institution, that can be different for different groups. I don't know if you want to add anything, Peter. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, think, I think that's a great answer. It does really depend on you. Um, and I, I think of two ends of the spectrum. I think of someone who knows exactly what they would like to do, and they should be looking at programs that have the funding and facility in that area uh, so they can pursue them. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, I can think of people who might only have a vague idea of a general area they would like to go into. Um, and there, I don't think they should be thinking about so much um, at, uh, freedom to do different things as opportunities to do different things. So that as they learn about the different possibilities, 
there definitely will be a number of them that are attractive and exciting to them. Um, so if I can just quickly deal with, uh, with a couple questions. We, we have uh, received some questions about whether there are schools we can recommend. Um, the answer to that, I believe, is just no. Uh, so you're going to have to go find what is a good match for you uh, in the course of all the different things that we've spoken about. Um, there, there's another question about how to find graduate students to talk to, since we've mentioned several times that that's a good idea. Um, if you don't, the easiest way is if you know graduate students who are currently in a school, people who have come through your program or people that your professors can put you in touch with. Um, that's the easiest way. Having a connection to graduate students uh, is the easiest way. But if you're interested in talking to graduate students at a school where you don't have uh, any connections, then you can write to the department administrator and say, hi, I was hoping you could put me in touch with a graduate student. I have some questions of this type. And in general, they will say, OK. They'll, they'll send out an email to say, is anybody interested in talking? And I mean, they, they're, they're trying to recruit. You know, it's, it's not um, just that they have something and they're trying to dispense it. They want to attract good people. And so part of that is helping to be informative to you when you have questions about the program. So you can take advantage of those resources. I mean, Jacob's ex exactly right about that, that uh, if you know someone there, the, the contact's wonderful. But if you don't, you can simply email the chair and, and ask uh, if you could be put into contact with a graduate student. Um, uh, if it's a particular area, you know, you can even say that. Perhaps write to a, um, a, a professor in the area and simply say, could you put me in contact with one of your graduate students? Um, as I say, I can't say these are always going to come back with wonderfully, uh, wonderful responses or responses at all. But I think you'll find that, as Jacob said, they're very interested in getting good uh, students to come to their uh, institution. And uh, they'll work with you on that. And you can uh, make those contacts. Great. So we have a Oh, can I just chime in with one little piece of information, too, that students might be interested in? Um, at the APS uh, March and April meeting, we often try to coordinate an a informal luncheon between undergraduates at the meeting and uh, members of FGSA, which is the Forum on Graduate Student Affairs. So keep your eyes peeled um, at the meetings, because we, we try to engineer some interactions between grad students and undergrads. So. Great. Thanks, Crystal. And I actually, Jacob, let me add one more thing I forgot. Yeah. Um, you can ask uh, your professors, or really any professional contact you have, if they know someone uh, in the department or in a research area. Um, and they can easily email them or give you them their name, and you can ask for a contact through them. So you could even put one person in between if need be. And certainly professors, your undergraduate professors, do know people at lots of graduate programs. So we have a couple of questions about international students, about how hard it is for international students either from abroad or international students who have uh, had their undergraduate education in the United States to get into graduate school. And then also whether the financial policies that apply to uh, American graduate students apply to international graduate students. So if, if I can start off on this, um, I, I would say that to some extent, th this will depend. But in general, graduate schools will apply the same financial policies to their international students as they do to their domestic ones. There can be some exceptions to that. But the, um, and, and you can read about them. There, this is not a hidden thing. This will be on websites. Um, but the, uh, a, a, I think very close to half of the PhDs granted in physics in the United States are from international students. There's a, there's a lot of support for it, and uh, it's not a, um, it's not just a completely different category um, in a way that it is often um, harder for the undergraduate admission process. Peter, I don't know if you wanted to add. No, I mean, that's, uh, that's exactly right. I didn't know, in, in general, I would say there's no difference. Um, and coming from an American institution, uh, as far as the application process is concerned, I don't think there's any difference. Uh, it might become a little bit more um, ticklish if you're applying from abroad to a graduate program. Um, and here I would say the same things I would to someone who's applying, say, from an institution that does not send a lot of students to that graduate program. I think you need to make some contacts. You need to 
uh, let them know a little bit about you, uh, uh, a visit, email, whatever is possible so that uh, in some sense you start to build up some identity um, because they won't have other things to go by. Um, so we have uh, some logistical questions, like if a school requests three letters of recommendation, is it okay to send four letters? Um, I would do it. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, I think that's good advice. I mean, some places might ignore it, so you need to be careful about that. Um, but well, let, having an let extra me put letter. A, yeah, let me put a proviso on that. Um, what you want are three letters of recommendation that will be useful. If you if one of the four is not as useful as the other three, then it actually might hurt a little bit. So you really need to think of who can write letters that will be informative. They know you. They know uh, your skills. They know your level of performance. Uh, they can talk about your strengths and weaknesses. They might even compare you with other students uh, uh, who have gone there. Um, think about who can say useful things about you, um, but uh, you know, and someone who simply just knows you and knows that you did well in their class, if that's all they say, it's not going to be uh, that useful. So when I say four, if you have them, I would first ask, do I have four people who can write useful letters? That, that's a very good point. <laughs> Um, so let's see, I think we have time for just a couple more questions. So uh, one of them is from someone who says, I took astrophysics in my freshman year and got a C plus. I'd like to pursue my graduate degree in astrophysics or cosmology. Should I retake the course? And th this is being written by someone who is right now a junior. Um, if, if I can say, one of the things that you want to do is to show that you are going to be able to perform in your program at a very high level. And certainly having a grade like C plus in the field that you are applying to graduate school in is not great. Now, you, if, if your school allows you to retake a course to mask the grade so that it doesn't appear, that can be one way of doing it. But if it was something as early as freshman year um, and it's going to stay on your transcript, then you, you want to explain it. You want to have uh, references that can explain that, there, that this was a, that why this is not representative of your ability in this field that you would like to go um, into graduate school in. And if there's a good reason and if you're, um, or if you're uh, advisors can say, look, you just weren't serious then, but now you, you've turned over a new leaf and you're very serious, then, then I think that you can still have a very good chance of admission. And I would only add that if your track record on physics and astronomy courses um, later than uh, freshman year um, are excellent you know, or strong, then I don't know if I would ask the question, should I retake that course? Um, because it looks bad. I think it would demonstrate, as Jacob said, um, that something was different then and you're certainly capable of much better work. On the other hand, you might ask yourself if, if it's important that you understand that material. If you, uh, if you have not had the chance to learn that material since freshman year and you think that's important, then you should learn the material. And if taking the course again would allow you to do that, that might be your reason. So we just have time for one more short question, um, and then we do have to wrap up. Uh, and so I, I'm just going to pick, um, we've gotten a couple of questions that are sort of like this, but we, we've talked about performing at a high level. But what, what kind of grades, what kind of GPA is considered performing at a high level? Uh, well, you might not want to hear this, but um, grades tend to be high uh, at American universities. And so performing at a high level, I think, is uh, performing better than a B, uh, because B is getting fairly close to um, average at some institutions. Um, and so I think we're talking about doing better than B work. Um, so I think that we are actually now fully out of time. And uh, I will hand it back over to Crystal once again. 
Okay. Well, thanks again, both of you, so much for that wonderful discussion. And thanks to everyone who stuck around and all the wonderful questions. Um, we will try to get uh, the ones that weren't answered to you guys, uh, maybe, uh, see if we can follow up. And I uh, hope you all have a, a great day. Thanks again, everyone, for, for joining us. Bye-bye. Okay.